Welcome back to New Realities. I'm Alan Steinfeld, and this is a continuing series on the updates of what's really going on inside the government and with the public's awareness of UFOs, UAPs. I am so happy to have back with me John Ramirez, former officer for the CIA who was privileged to have some inside information that I don't know if you can talk about or not, but um, but let's hear. But John has also analyzed the latest in congressional legislation about the UAP phenomena. So, John, what is Congress planning to tell us and what is the workings? What's going on? Well, stepping back to the previous legislation, uh, there was something we know as the National Defense Authorization Act, and that applied to the previous fiscal year that runs from October 1st, 2021, and ends on September 30, 2022. And that NDA legislation uh, with some UAP legis legislative language in it became part of the United States Code. The law of the land is not the pieces of bills that are signed individually by the president but rather the law of the land is contained in U.S. code that incorporates that legislative language. So me, I was just going to ask you one thing, because I looked at some of that bill and I didn't see any UAP language. All I saw was anomalous. They use the word anomalous. Is that what they're calling it or was it UAP stuff I missed? Uh, th th they actually do spell out UAP oh, and they they're going to change the name of UAP to something that's more accurately descriptive of the phenomenon that people are seeing. What would they change that to? Uh, they're actually saying uh, aerospace undersea phenomenon. So okay. in that sense, it incorporates more of the transmedium type of excursions these objects do uh, display. So do you want to talk about but what was in the NDAA, National Defense, um, what is it, Administration? Um, National Defense Authorization, Authorization Act. From um, for, for 21 to 22, yeah. Right, which is ending uh, this fall on September 30, 2022. And so usually around the springtime, uh, these congressional committees will draft legislation respective to whatever the committee has oversight over. So um, in the, our case, uh, we have two major committees. Uh, that's the Armed Services Committee of both the House and Senate. And we have the Intelligence Committee of both the House and Senate. So there's four committees right there. And there are probably other committees that have some oversight uh, as to how this process goes forward in, within the government committees with congressional oversight, um, there are many, many uh, in all aspects of the way the military and the Defense Department and the intelligence community um, operate. So uh, again, stepping back, the NDAA for fiscal year 2021-22 uh, contained UAP language and in it, that language was incorporated into the law of the land, which is US Code Title, uh, Title 50. And it's in a section called 3373. So if you Google search US code 50, 3373, you're gonna come up with that language. It's, it's a huge document. Okay, it's, but it's can you tell law. us some of what the law is, what the law says? It's exactly what the NDAA FY2122 said and as far as establishing um, a more in-depth study into the uh, UAP phenomenon. And so it's what we discussed before that once contained the Gillibrand Amendment, it was no longer in there when it became law. Uh, Gillibrand proposed having civilian science, such as Galileo projects, such as SEU, to participate with the government. And that was all stricken out. Uh, what did survive was the idea that the government should be more forthcoming in reporting what they know. Uh, but it did not have, I don't think, in my opinion, enough teeth in the law to, uh, to kind of compel go uh, government to do so. Uh, the big difference in the FY23 legislation, it is more specific. 
not only to what the government should look at, but how it should look at it and who should manage the information and how that information should be shared within the government to Congress, and not only that, to the public. And that public sector was preserved in the Intelligence Authorization Act passed by the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. That bill is now on the floor of the Senate for discussion and debate and amendments. So Wait, things let, can happen to it. Let me ask you, so the Gillibrand Amendment was does, um, um, struck down, so there is no office for Gillibrand to study this? This ASRO or ASTRO, Astro Office, is not contained in the law of the land, US Code 53373. It's not in there. Okay. So what about the other things about people with NDAs, non-disclosure agreements coming forward? How, what's, because some, everyone's talking about, oh, now it's time that people can come out like a Lou Elizondo and speak about what they know. What's going on with the law? Well, um, again, stepping back, there, there has been uh, provisions in U.S. code for whistleblower protections. And so the FY23 legislation now has that as a feature, the strengthening of whistleblower protections. It also strengthens the authority of the inspector general in the intelligence community and the Department of Defense. So they have more teeth to do what they need to do to investigate their own agencies that they are complying with the rules and regulations set forth within the agency and also the laws passed by Congress. So that's in there. Mm -hmm. um, so that that's, to me, is a positive step forward. Now, I mentioned whistleblower protections yeah. uh, and Inspector General strengthening. Uh, so in the UAP legislation, uh, it specifies not just general whistleblower protections, but those who have knowledge about the UAP topic to be able to come forward if they feel like their agencies or departments are holding back deliberately, trying to hide or obscure or obfuscate um, the actual facts of what's going on. So mm -hmm. there's provisions in there that uh, an employee, for example, who has information that that employee feels is important to the narrative, that employee still has what we call a chain of command. It still has to go through that employee's upper management up to the director, perhaps. But now, if there's no action, uh, the employee is then free to go to the inspector general. And then the inspector general, if there's no action within 30 days and having reported to the inspector general, that employee is now authorized by this new law, if it passes as law, to go to Congress directly, to go to the relevant committees directly. Um, that didn't exist at, uh, before, but there was precedent uh, due to, for example, going back to uh, to the time of the uh, congressional investigation into the White House interactions with Ukraine, if you remember that, uh, we had a CIA whistleblower who yeah. went to his IG and then the IG with no action from management, then the IG authorized that that whistleblower can then go to the House Select uh, Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence and report what he knew about what was going on inside the White House in terms of the National Security Council, Ukraine, and the Oval Office. And so, so that was done. And now, now that what he did, what the Inspector General did, and what the whistleblower did, it's now more codified into the law. Great. So let's take someone for an example, and may or may not be, but hypothesize, you know, people know Luis Elizondo, they know he has an NDA, they know he has a lot of insider knowledge about the phenomenon. He's kind of pushing the disclosure envelope. What could he do under this law? Well, there's something he could do now. Um, he can go on the Department of Defense side. Um, he can go to the people who can authorize uh, any information to come out publicly to have them determine whether or not it's classified or not. Um, so there might be an NDA in place but there might be ways to share the information in that NDA without disclosing sources and methods. 
And so the Department of Defense has a process. And if you look at the opening pages um, in James, Dr. James Lukatsky's Skinwalkers at the Pentagon book, yeah. in the opening pages, he stated that this book was reviewed by the Department of Defense for security purposes. And there was nothing in the book deemed to be classified, but he did have to make certain redactions to protect people's names. And so that's, that's a provision that's already existing. Uh, I, for example, uh, I have to go through in CIA what's known as the Pre-Publication Classification Review Board, a mouthful of words, PCRB is what we call it inside. And they will review my slide presentations and talks that I've given, um, and they will determine what's classified and what's not classified. And so far, um, I've had uh, success in being forthcoming with them, and they're forthcoming with me. They haven't really redacted anything that I've I've said or stated in a slide. But what about this program that you you haven't cleared this program with the CIA? Have you? I mean. I can only talk about what I put in the slides and my uh, talking about, about congressional bills is my right as a U.S. citizen uh, mm -hmm. who will be electing uh, my representatives uh, to the House and Senate in here in the state of Arizona. So as as, uh, as a U.S. citizen, I have that right anyway mm -hmm. to have my opinions on impending legislation. Did you, but you can also, you mentioned before in previous programs, you could talk a little bit about the UFO UAP discussion within the CIA. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? And then we'll go back to Congress. That's really juicy. What, what you were aware of working as an officer in CIA of the phenomena. Okay. So uh, again, going back to what I can say, because yeah. the PCRB has reviewed what I will say. Um, they know what knowledge I have because I wrote a letter to them uh, explaining what I would be doing. Uh, this was back before anyone knew me at all mm -hmm. and laid down, if this is what I know and this is what I can say. And they just basically came back with, well, we'll be interested in your slides and we'll monitor what you say. And if you say something that you shouldn't, we'll let you know. <laughs> so, you know, that's the sandbox I play in. And so I do have NDAs uh, protecting sources and methods of collection systems. And so when I talk about um, uh, UAPs, UFOs, UAPs, it's basically because it, the work I did in CIA, it has to do a lot with signals intelligence collection. And so when, and also did systems uh, analysis of weapon systems in our adversarial countries. If the adversarial country uh, with its radar, which is a signal emanated, detected something unusual in their sky, uh, then that's an interest to me because the radar detected it, they detected an object that was unusual and they may have gone into a higher state of alert, which is of interest to our policymakers and our military leaders. So I would look at that issue. And then if I find out through sources and methods that what they were tracking was not US missiles, of course they were not US missiles, and they were not satellites. They were not their own. There was nothing they could identify as something terrestrial, then that piques my interest. And that piqued the interest of the Department of Defense. Uh, this was during the Clinton years. And so the Deputy Secretary of Defense, whose name was John Deutsch, later became CIA director, he inquired to the CIA through his briefer uh, they, these policymakers get daily briefings every morning. Ask the briefer if we, CIA, knew anything about what the Russians detected and this high alert that the Russia went into. So that landed on my desk, and I did the research for that and pretty much determined that they were detecting some unusual objects that were not aircraft, not missiles, not satellites, but they were flying. And apparently they were flying in some kind of formation with some kind of intent to a destination. Uh, but I did not say they were flying saucers or UFOs. I just said there are unknown objects of great interest to um, the Russian military command, to the Russian leadership, and we eliminated these, leaving it up to the Deputy Secretary of Defense to make up his own mind. At that point, he can then get further inquiries into his own department. Mm. But 
I believe that the DI probably already did the same type of analysis. Uh, my closest colleagues in intelligence were in DIA and they may have done some work and, but he may have wanted another, if you will, a second opinion from CIA on our take because we do have uh, more insight into uh, sources and methods that are extremely sensitive. Um, but was there, can you tell us, was there open discussions about UFOs, UAPs within the CIA? I mean, can you answer that question? Uh, the, the truth is, is that CIA has always had discussions within the HC about this phenomenon. When you say open, um, probably not. Within CIA, it was probably a special compartment, uh, mainly due to how that information was collected and how that information was extracted from that source. Mm -hmm. And so we don't collect from US citizens. Um, if we are looking at the UFO issue, it's because another country is looking at the UFO issue and we're re reporting to our policymakers what their policymakers are mm -hmm. doing in that regard. Right. So let's go back to the congressional um, bills that have just been uh, in instigated in Congress. And what do they say? What, what, how will this lead to a more open citizenry about the UAP phenomena? Well, to address the um, participation of citizens yeah. uh, in the unclassified world, um, the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, or we call it the SISI. Um, I rather prefer to use the SISI because the other whole term is uh, quite a tongue twister. But the SISI um, had language in its IAA for a information sharing activity sponsored by the DNI that has uh, two phases. One is an internal phase within the ODNI, within the intelligence agencies to report information that employees of the intelligence agencies might hold or might have seen or experienced personally. The other is an information sharing system for public use. And that's a first. So I don't know how it's gonna get fleshed out in the final legislation, but the draft language, at least as it's in the SISI, as passed by the committee, uh, in the SISI IAA language as passed by the committee, does contain uh, a provision for information sharing uh, from the public to the government. Mm -hmm. So this is like official. So if um, someone sees an object, a UFO, there would be a place within the government or being set up by the government to report a sighting? Is that what they're, you're propo they're proposing? The language is very um, vague at the moment, but the way I read it in that paragraph, that's what it says. Hmm. What are you hoping for if um, you could write the laws and what would be the best to bring this phenomena out into the open. Is, it, is that what we're seeing, a progression of laws? Or are we still seeing a lot of cover-ups and holding back in these new legislation? Uh, legislation, uh, legislation does not cover anything up. The legislation is just the laws that these departments and agencies must follow. So there's nothing about a cover-up unless Congress is not interested in getting more information. So the, the, it's important to understand that the federal government, the departments and agencies of the federal government will reply literally to a question. And right. so it's not a cover up if you use the wrong term and they legitimately go and look into their records and say, we never use that term. Oh, we have something associated with that term. We actually called it something else. But in social media, this term was used and everyone in social media believes this is the true term. Mm -hmm. And so because they didn't ask for what we know about this program, but used a term for it, we're gonna deny the term. So there's no such thing as you name the term. UFOs. Um, yeah, if you ask well, no, not UFOs. Sp specifically, not UFOs, but specifically like the TR3B. People say it's called a TR3B. It might not be called a TR-3B. They may be a craft 
that can do the things that people have witnessed the so-called PR3B do. But because in social media that was like released without any explanation of what might be TR2, because there is a TR1. There is a TR1. There is no TR2. And all of a sudden someone says there's a TR3. They made that up. Right. Because even the Air Force would say, yeah, there is a TR, but we're calling it the TRX. We mm -hmm. haven't assigned it a number yet. And it will be flying in the 2020s. They released that uh, publicly. The Air Force did right. through their contractor. So that way but, they're not lying. They're just going by what you ask right. is what we're telling you. But exactly. in one of the um, NDAA um, sections, there was something about anomalous health effects on people. And that was a whole section of, right. of and, and so that's a yeah. hint. Yeah, so talk well, about that. It's basically a hint. Um, there's no correlation in the legislation uh, tying the, um, uh, the anomalous health incidents, the AHIs, with UAPs. There's mm -hmm. none of that. Of course, however, they're not explaining. Yeah, go ahead, however. However, yes. uh, people in the intelligence community, people in certain military communities have experienced effects that are more like the skinwalker effect, the, this hitchhiker effect, this high mm -hmm. strangeness, both physiologically and psychology, psychologically. Mm -hmm. And so the, uh, that part of the legislation is to ensure that the departments and agencies treat them as legitimate health concerns and that the departments and agencies make sure that our health insurance plans that we select every year during mm -hmm. open season, that the federal health insurance plans address these anomalous health incidents mm -hmm. that now you can, I can go to my health provider and say, I've had this and they can say, Oh yeah, you're a federal employee. And we cover that no expense to uh -huh. you or, or that we can cover it with a copay. That's what that legislation was all about is to enable health services to be provided to the employees to the men and women in uniform that may have experienced this, mm -hmm. but it did not make any correlation to, oh, it has something to do with UAPs. Yeah, it doesn't have any correlation, but they're not saying what the cause of the anomalous health effects was. They're not saying cause. Right. And so the legislation yeah. did say that the uh, intelligence community and the Department of Defense need to continue to analyze uh, these health uh, anomalous health uh, incidents and determine the cause of them and to provide some mitigation for that cause. On the State Department side, if the cause was sourced to a foreign government, then of course it becomes the diplomatic matter and the State Department can handle that. If it's a military type of cause, that is a foreign adversary may have used a certain type of system to make these anomalous health incidents occur, then of course that goes on to, to the Department of Defense side to create countermeasures for what is causing these incidents. And for the State Department, who's responsible for constructing our embassies and securing our embassies, to make sure they're fortified against any kind of external source of these incidents. So that's but, in there. That's in the legislation. But how close are we? And you know what we're really looking for. We're looking for the government to come out and we may be a long way saying, yes, foreign adversary, it's not Russian, China, it's not ours. It's off planet. It's, it's extraterrestrial. It's from another world with a, another intelligence. How close, if at all or ever, are we to that sort of language and awareness of the American public by the government. Okay, so um, in the legislation, that language exists. Uh, oh, the does. way that legislation gets implemented and then the way the Department of Defense responds to legislation, uh, that's where um, the issues are to address your concerns, Alan, and to address concerns of, of all of your viewers. So you're um, saying the extraterrestrial language exists within the legislation? It exists in, in this form. Uh, it exists in that there are domains of the phenomenon appearing that do not necessarily come from under the sea, on the sea, uh, on the ground, in the air, in space. 
those domains and the new legislation and the sissy IAA, it states that the intelligence communities and the DOD should also investigate this phenomenon that are not coming from those domains. Do so, they ever say the word extraterrestrial? No, they, ever... they didn't. No, Thank to you. your point, they do not. Because when you say extraterrestrial, you say off world. You're saying yeah. it's from another planet. Yeah. Well, if you listen closely to some of us former officers, <laughs> uh, we're using words like interdimensional hypothesis. We're using words like ultra terrestrial hypothesis, meaning they're coming from uh, domains that we're not fully aware or understand. Mm -hmm. And they're coming from domains that are not necessarily from outer space, ultra terrestrial being they're a lot closer to us that may have been on the planet all along, but they're coming to us in forms that appear to be otherworldly. That opens up a huge door uh, to bring in what the experiencers, uh, the uh, channelers, and even our own government in terms of the remote viewers have stated all along. And there are records of what remote viewers have said in some of the released documents. Uh, mm. like the existence of a galactic federation uh, that was found in uh, the CIA files. And that was a remote viewing mm -hmm. uh, done by uh, Mel Riley, the late Mel Riley, a remote viewer. And that remote viewing session was facilitated by Ed Danes. So that's, that's, in, that's in there. Um, yeah. And okay. so also in, in, public, in public, in the public forum, we have um, DNI Abel Haynes saying they may be coming to us extraterrestrially. And so th they're not necessarily saying that. You won't get uh, two or three or many witnesses sitting before a congressional committee to state the word extraterrestrial, saying that this is where it's coming from. Uh, but because that closes the other possibilities. And I believe the government knows more than they're just like, space men and women, space brothers and sisters from another planet coming to us and craft that look like saucers. There's more to but it than that. There's more to it, but that would be the first step. Of course, there's more to it. There might be interdimensional, but will they ever show us the bodies? Will they ever show us the crash retrievals? I mean, this was what we're looking for. Uh, I'm not looking for crash retrievals or bodies. Um, okay. That to me is, is very uninteresting. Uh, I assume that they're there. And it's not because I have any direct knowledge of it. I have indirect knowledge of it. And so uh, for me, disclosure doesn't include that. Uh, but for many others, uh, it may include that. And when I stated why I don't know, uh, of course, um, you have skeptics in the bunkers and just plain trolls that will come after you because I can't show any proof of any of this. Uh, but, you know, I know that something was retrieved. I know that something was inside what was retrieved and I know that it was studied, but I can't show you any document saying that. I hadn't seen them. It was told to me orally in a briefing. Mm -hmm. um, now, Chase Brandon, who was a CIA officer and the director of operations, who later uh, was an officer in the public affairs, uh, he was responsible for the liaison between CIA and the entertainment industry. He wrote a book called Crypto's Conundrum. And in his book, he pretty much laid out what he, in, in fictional form, laid out what he saw, what he claims he saw in a, uh, in a uh, box of files in the historical intelligence collection at CIA. So right. there's a CIA officer that said it. Now, as far as having uh, a uh, sitting uh, official in the Department of Defense or in the intelligence community to say, yeah, yeah it's all real. And there are bodies, there are, there are uh, retrieved uh, craft. Um, they're not gonna say it. However, this legislation builds up the momentum so that legislatively there, there, there exists what we call top cover for these officials to say it. And top cover is that you're not protected by legislation that you can say this. And it's called back stopping that we have your back and that when you go out and say it, uh, we're not going to throw you under the bus. 
That's what happened to Lou Elizondo. He basically got, using the term, thrown under the bus. Um, mm -hmm. Officials in the Department of Defense denied that he had anything to do with this. They even denied that um, that any of this OSAP study had anything to do with UFOs. Uh, James Lakatsky publicly said to George Knapp uh, that uh, it has everything to do with UFOs. And yet right. the, the Department of Defense spokesperson denied that. Uh, this legislation will stop that from happening because this legislation makes provisions for the government to come forward to Congress to tell Congress about everything you ever done prior to this legislation being enacted. Tell us how you misinformed, disinformed, that you lied, uh, that you covered up, all of that. You will tell us what you did and why. And, and you when will we tell us. You yeah. will see that whenever this legislation becomes law. So when this legislation becomes law, which could be in 22, 23, then do you expect congressional hearings to call these people out and say, why did you lie? Is that what we can expect? I wouldn't hold my breath to expect anything because Congress, um, the congressional committees of Congress sets its own calendar as to what hearings they would wish to have. So if you're looking for a public hearing, you may not get that. To go into that, um, you might have closed door sessions and you won't know what's in the content of the closed door session. You just know the fact of that a closed door session is being held before the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, uh, a closed door session before the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, uh, the Senate and House Armed Services Committees. You'll see that there's a closed door session, but what they discuss is, is never is never published. Well, do you, okay, we may or may not know of that level, but do you believe there should be amnesty for the people who did lie saying they were doing their job, which is an awful excuse and they were covering up? What do you believe about that or personally feel? Well, the plans and policies of the executive branch of government um, and the regulations and rules formulated by the executive branch government are what we, the rank and file follow, what the departments and agencies follow. So that comes from the very top. And so if they're told from the top to do this, um, actually, if they're not put under oath, they, they didn't break a law. It's not breaking the law to lie unless you're put under oath. So um, in instances of where you hear uh, things coming out, um, you know, it's basically individuals saying things. Individuals like me and my colleagues, former colleagues of CIA, uh, former colleagues in the intelligence community and in the military, there are a lot of talking heads uh, saying things. Uh, we don't need amnesty to say what we say because we're not saying this under oath. Uh, amnesty uh, is not a good word for me. To, uh, I don't like that. Okay. Um, I, I prefer that it is more internally, more of a rules and regulations change to further define the role of the inspector general and the authority of the inspector general and the role and authority um, of the department heads, the agency heads. And so it strengthens the ability for individuals within these agencies and departments to come forward without repercussions, without retribution is what I say. So it's mm. not amnesty from the public. They're not, okay. it's not a court case and they're under oath. Retribution um, is a better it's word. retribution yes. against their careers. And right. so to me, that's the important part because that's what's holding back a lot of folks from coming forward. They don't want their careers to be destroyed. They don't want their reputations to be destroyed. Uh, and so, the law provides for that not happening because the inspectors generals of the various departments and agencies are charged with making sure that doesn't happen. So you're and, saying the new law, the new legislation, if it's passed, will protect people from retribution. That's the, uh, that's what you're saying. Right. And, go ahead, take a drink. Uh, no, because you've been talking, but it's fascinating. So we are getting closer to uh, well, you don't call it disclosure, but I would call it a disclosure point. And but before I get ask you what you think disclosure is, I want to ask, what is the food chain, let's say, 
in the hierarchy, keeping this thing undercover since Roswell. Is there a department? Are there individuals? Because obviously someone is pushing the buttons and 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 manipulating the the um, narrative. I would say, who who is that? Uh, I don't know who they are by name, um, but it's been um, theorized that there was such a group known as Majestic 12 or MJ12. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I tell people don't use names or labels because the government will say we, we had a group, but it wasn't called MJ12. We actually called it something else. And this uh -huh. MJ12 term got released to the public, but we know that this wasn't the name of the, of the uh, management function within the government. So we'll deny that there was an MJ-12. But uh, was there like, or is there a, a group of individuals um, within the executive branch of government that may represent aspects of the Department of Defense and may represent aspects of the civilian intelligence community um, that have met for the purpose of managing the narrative managing the narrative i would say yes there is such a group and i think it's still in existence today i see so now re most recently we put a label to this group you know most recently we started labeling the uap task force or in the new legislation this undersea uh this aerospace undersea phenomenon uh joint program office so we put in labels to it, but there's always been some group that has managed this. Now, on the Department of Defense side, uh, this management of the narrative might be tied into uh, the alleged exploitation of recovered technology. And so now it becomes a matter of protecting a capability that our U.S. military might have that they do not want our adversaries to know. And the way to do that is to protect all of it and not let us know because we live in a society where, you know, information is much more propagated uh, in a public sphere than in some adversarial countries. So we can't tell anyone about this. So we will like put it in a, uh, a compartment. Uh, we'll put it in a, uh, un, uh, a waved, um, we'll put it in a carve out, which waves the normal, uh, 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 sensitive access programs. Uh, we'll put it in these mechanisms to protect it, and that might be going on. And so that's a whole nother animal there that they, they won't disclose UFOs, UAPs, because they actually exploited the technology in UFOs and UAPs, and they don't want the exploitation to be revealed. So we'll just deny the total existence of UFOs and UAPs, and that has gone on before. They don't want the explanation exploration to be revealed because it, it will show secret weapons that have been developed by the U.S. Is that what you're saying? Well, um, you used the term weapons. Um, I I think it's more related to how we're able to conduct espionage using technology um, and not necessarily a weapon system. That is the propulsion systems and uh, the other systems on board such a device uh, will be difficult to detect and can have what the golden uh, thing for us in the intelligence community when we come to collection is persistent collection. Persistent collection meaning you can stay on target forever as long as you need until the mission is accomplished. And we don't get that from satellites. Um, very well, especially not photographic satellites because they are in orbit. They only have a certain time to view targets on the ground. And they have a list of targets that they need to follow where they need to point their optics in one way or another way. It's called the collection deck. And they need to service the collection deck. Um, and we may have ways to collect signals persistently, but to actually look for objects like that, are, are it's difficult to do. And to look for like a, uh, a facility in a foreign country of interest, such as a nuclear weapons facility, we need to be on top of it all the time. So if they created something, it's not a weapon system. It's more of a what we call an intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance ISR system. 
And I believe that's what might be protected. And I have no knowledge of that. I am speculating as a US citizen, being able to, with using my knowledge, to be able to read behind the lines of what might be out, up there. All right, thanks. Oh yeah, take a drink. Thank you. I appreciate you coming forward. I mean, I consider you a real hero and a patriot who wants to get the truth out to the public with, you know, within the limits that have been, you know, confined to due to your past history, right? I mean, you still have- Yeah, I. it's not necessarily I want the truth to come out to the public. It's mm -hmm. more, I want the government to reveal what it knows to the public in a way that protects government equities. There's ways mm -hmm. to protect this without revealing everything. Uh, if I had to do a, a let's say, a do-over of Roswell, July 47, yeah. if I had to do a do-over, I would make it a scientific discovery mm. and have scientists look at it in the open because a, a craft like that with alleged beings from another world, to me, that's like a remarkable scientific discovery. And why wasn't science involved? Why was, the, uh, why was then the military involved? Um, because... They didn't know what it was, and they thought it was might be uh, from an adversary like Russia, and they wanted to exploit it. They wanted to take it apart and see how it worked. And so it went in that realm, and it never came out of that realm. They could have done the same thing by giving it to a university or universities and having um, even government scientists outside of the military, outside of the intelligence community, to look into what was recovered and share that information, as well as have then um, the military folks look into the information that the scientists are working on. That is, science will then give to the government some of that information, but leave it primarily in science. That didn't happen. Right. But Yeah. If you look yeah. at Corso's book, The Day After Roswell, Colonel Corso says the technology from those crash retrievals of Roswell were given to industry, given to corporations to further their development and um, create a whole industry that the public was left out of. And um, that's what we're still suffering from. I mean, that's what it says in the day after Roswell, basically, right? I would say this, that that process happens all the time. And it's not even always related to UFOs or UAPs. Um, that is a function of the Department of Defense and intelligence community. It's called foreign material um, exploitation. So but foreign material analysis, exploitation, we do that to everything, not just the UFOs, UAP issue. But if the US government is finding um, technology that belongs to the American people and then giving it to private industry is selling out the American people isn't that's how I say is am I am I getting that right because who's well, inside the military giving it to corporations yeah well I mean uh, you're talking about UFO technology specifically yes 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 oh I mean it's it's part of this FMAE process I mean there's a process no matter what's collected that may be of value to the U.S. government to the U.S. military that process is legal and so there is an FMAE process uh, it depends on what domain that object uh, might have made its appearance in. So but they're, giving aircraft, it to corporate, they're giving it to corporate interests. That is legal. Of, that is legal. But who's is benefiting legal. from that besides the corporations making money off of that? We kind are of because they're developing technology from it that we can use on the battlefield. That oh. we're developing technology that we can use to conduct this uh, uh, intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance function. Uh, the actual spying function is ISR from technical spying. We call it ISR. Developing but they're also systems developing that. technology that they can promote to give profits to their own corporations. That, is a, that is a myth. That is a myth. Oh, and here's okay. where the myth comes. So if it comes from the government, if it comes from the government, there's a government contract to do this. That is government owned. Therefore, it's owned by the citizens of the United States. That's a true That's fact. That's what I thought. Yes. Right. Yes. So what happens if the government then wipes its hands of this technology and say, we don't want to exploit it, uh, but we want you to look at it. Go ahead and look at it. 
go ahead and market it, if you will. Um, that can happen. So, and maybe that has happened. And that's what Corso kind of alluded to the fact that yeah. that's what happened because there were products coming out of it. He yes. alleges like fiber optics and other, yes. what we call like inventions now, but there were new discoveries back then. Uh, but a lot of the science to develop like uh, lasers and fiber optics, a lot of that science as basic science research pre-existed Roswell. So scientists mm. were already looking at semiconductors. So it's not that we found a transistor on board Roswell and all of a sudden we have semiconductors. That didn't happen. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've already done a lot of the basic research on this and we continue to do basic research on it. So I don't buy the argument that it's illegal. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I, I would say that if they are doing this and with a private comp uh, group of individuals, so that private group of group of individuals can personally profit from the technology, uh, that is criminal. That's a criminal right. offense. So what because do you think we could, I mean, you're aware of course that there are such technologies, other world and they have an advanced physics. What do you feel we can learn from what you know of their technology? And, and when are we gonna get that basically? Well, I don't personally know that there's such technology. I have to go by what's been stated by scientists who have worked with government uh, on these projects. So I have to go by what they say. I have to trust that what they say is true. Uh -huh. And so there's what, what have I'm they said. What have they, what well, have I they mean, said? Uh, there's that the crash retrievals are real and uh -huh. materials were exploited to study and exploit it to see how they work. Mm -hmm. That they never said that, oh, and by the way, well, we have this remarkable triangular craft that can fly because of this. That's that's the missing link in this story. They had never stated that. I personally, it's a personal conviction of mine, not informed by anything other than people have seen it and Lukatsky's book had a section in it describing triangular craft. Uh, I have to believe that these craft exist. Too many eyewitnesses have seen this. Mm -hmm. um, and I have to say, yeah, they exist. So what would disclosure look like for you if you're saying you're not, not interested in the bodies and crap? What does that mean to you? Uh, for me, it's, it's more of the reason why we're getting these visitations and why they're here and any message that they may have for us. And so to me, the message is more important than the delivery package. Um, the craft and the bodies, they're the drivers and the truck that brought my package to my front door. It's up to me to open it, to see what's inside of it. And that's the part where to me is, is disclosure for me. Uh, we're getting steps there through dissemination. For me, it's a controlled dissemination. We do this, we do this, we do this. In a certain control faction, they step back, see what the public reaction might be, and then continue to do more dissemination. I think that's the process. But having said that, there seems to be a rush toward some kind of conclusion to your point, Alan, something is going to be revealed. And so it's going to be a revelation. Uh, I like those words beside other than disclosure. I mean, that to but me, that's- You mean, you're saying on the part of who these other beings, that's what's coming It forward. can happen two ways. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It can happen that these other beings uh, are coming and they're going to show themselves um, regardless of whether they're ready or not, it's, it's up to the, the governments of the world to get their citizens ready. And so within the last several years, um, the U.S. government has certainly accelerated this dissemination. And uh, I would uh, paraphrase uh, Mr. Elizondo. He said that, um, you know, we're working on this. We're always working on this. We continue to work on this. And uh, if you don't want to get it in these dribs and drabs, because that's how we have to give it to you now, uh, just get a hobby for five years and come back and it'll all be out. He made but, statements yeah. to that effect. So 2027 is five years from now. That coincides with what a lot of channelers and experiencers have been saying. There's just something significant happening in 2027. So right. that remains to be seen. That would be interesting to see. I got 2024, but you're, uh, as far as like, for revelation of some of this, but dribs and drabs are on both sides of the aisle, let's say, from the government and from the visitors, whoever they are. 
the the uh, both sides of the aisle from the yeah in that sense yeah That's fine. Um, I I would say that the uh, the visitors have uh, been much more active and kinetic in their appearances. We're seeing them everywhere. People have seen them everywhere. They're being detected by everything we have that's flying in space and in the air, on the ground, looking up in the sea. And we it's increased that. over the last couple of years. Uh, it could be a function that our sensors are so much better, uh, but I think the frequency plus our sensors being so much better contribute to the increase in um, our awareness of their presence. Well, let me ask you a personal question. You don't have to answer if you don't want, but have you had an experience, a sighting, an interaction? Uh, yes, I've had that all over, uh, all throughout my life. Can that you happened, talk about uh, what happened to you? Some of your- Usually it's sightings uh, of an object that no one else sees. Uh, and uh, around 1959, uh, I was six years old and uh, I saw something in the sky that my playmates did not see, my cousins did not see. It was over uh, Fort Lee, Virginia. I was living with my aunt and uncle. My uncle was in the US Army at Fort Lee. And so I saw an object that I guess looked very much like a Tic Tac, but it's large. It's very, very, very large. And I saw it coming, uh, floating up above the trees and I pointed to this object and none of my playmates and my cousins, they didn't know what I was pointing at and it drifted away. Uh, that's one example, the earliest I can remember seeing actual craft. And then um, there are the orbs that I've seen uh, mm -hmm. in adulthood. I've seen orange, an orange orb, I've seen a white orb and I received messages from the white orb that I should come out and talk about what I know. Uh, that they, so they said, we know you know things and it's time for you to share what you know. Now's the time. And that prompted me to finish up a draft presentation I, I've had for many years uh, that I, I put together this uh, draft in 2015, 2016 timeframe. I brushed it off, uh, polished it up, sent it to CIA and it came back uh, approved. And that's the uh, briefing slides that many have seen. Well, can, can you share some of what they, that you do know that you're here to give to the world? Because we, we want to know, listening to you, if you care to share something. Well, this is uh, my, the message to me uh, have been personal, but I can share this much. It's more uh, not a dire warning. It's, it's more like uh, it's your responsibility. It's you, your responsibility. It's humanity's responsibility to take care of this planet because we live on it too. And we don't like what you've been doing, and, but you have free will. And so exercise your free will to take care of your planet. Because if you don't, um, you, you, your species may suffer dire consequences if the planet turns against you. That we're doing things to the planet, but the planet will defend itself and it's not necessary for planet Earth to be viable with humans on it. Planet Earth will be viable with no humans on it. And in fact, it might be even more viable that the Earth will clean itself up in like 20 to 40 years if there were no humans on it. So it's more of our existence on this planet which we share with these visitors. Uh, I call these visitors residents because they've been here. That's the ultra terrestrial hypothesis. And mm. our discovery of nuclear weapons is not good for them. And they've demonstrated that they can shut them down or deactivate nuclear weapons to cause them not to launch. That's what happened on our side. They never uh, removed the physics package from the warheads of the Minuteman Man 2. That was never done. Uh, those warheads were still viable. There's a rumor that you know they couldn't have been nuclear but apparently the warheads are still viable, but they disabled the ability to launch those, those missiles carrying the warheads. I've heard on the Russian side, it was the opposite. They have a first strike policy. And on the Russian side, it was the, um, it was the actual disablement of the nuclear weapon itself. And that's been talked about. I have no sources for it, uh, but others have said that's what happened. I've read that they've also been activated on the Russian side, went online and there was some- Right, panic. I'm sorry. You're absolutely yeah. right. I misspoke. Right. Uh, no, you're right. It was activated. Instead of deactivating them, 
Right. Uh, they activated the uh, warheads on the Russian side. So it's like, how does it make you feel not be able to launch a first strike for them? For us, it was, how does it make you feel not to respond to a first strike from your adversary? And so the message was delivered, I think, to both sides, because shortly thereafter, mm -hmm. and I can't correlate it directly, but shortly thereafter, um, within the same year as Maelstrom, uh, uh, President Johnson spoke with uh, Premier Alexei Kosygin, mm -hmm. proposing that um, discussions be held to reduce or limit the strategic weapons of both countries. And that uh, culminated in the SALT-1 treaty signed by uh, Brezhnev and President Nixon. And that's a succession of treaties that have occurred since then. Right. So if we look at the big picture, there seems to be increased sightings, increased detection. There's government legislation being proposed. People are coming out. You're speaking about it. Um, you're thinking maybe 2027 is a possible time frame where it'll all be uncovered. I, I don't know. I'm just asking. What do you think the big picture looks like for the phenomena? Oh, the big picture is that uh, dissemination will occur in uh, stages and that'll culminate in a revelation that might occur uh, within five years. I think that's the bigger picture. Um, and we put dates to these things, but you know, five years to me is uh, not sooner, not later. So I don't know if it's five years. That's what uh, certain segments of the channeling and experiencer community have been saying. Right. Mm -hmm. But don't you think it has a larger threat um, to corporations? Because obviously these ships are not filling up their gas tanks to get here. There's a technology that the world can benefit from. And I think even Hal Putoff was doing a study about, you know, non-fossil fuel uh, energy systems and its effect on economies, something like that he was studying. So, yeah. That's a bigger picture. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what. Um, if they can't meter it, we won't have it. Uh, they'll find a way to meter it. That is to say, they'll find a way for make, make, to make us pay for it. Um, because, like, for example, solar panels. Um, I have solar panels in my house uh, right now. They're, they're a, a full solar panel system. powers everything in my house right now. And I get a, a token electric bill of about 25 bucks every month, mm -hmm. even during this hot weather here in Arizona, uh, with the AC running, um, I get 20, uh, my electric bill is $25. So there's some way they figured out to meter it, even though they're my solar panels I own. Uh, I would say that they'll figure out a, a way to meter free energy, so it won't be as free as we think. Um, I don't know what kind of device would be required to provide free energy to homes. I don't know if we need uh, a power generation plant that sends free energy through the transmission lines, but somewhere along the line where it's delivered individually to the home, and that's gonna cost because you need to buy the device, you need to connect it to your current um, appliances. There may, mm -hmm. there may need to be changes made to appliances to make use of this energy. Uh, and there may uh, be a need to deliver it through transmission lines in some way, whether it's over the air, that's Tesla's idea. Let's transmit signal uh, power over the air as a radio signal, essentially, an electromagnetic signal. signal. Uh, they'll find a way to meter it. And so I, I don't think it's gonna be that but free. But that's what's wrong with the, I, we have to get away, I think eventually from a kind of corporate mentality and, and give the, money back to the people the economy and i mean just imagine if everyone had a little free energy device in their in their house or apartment uh that would change their life and, and it would be a lot better for the planet and we could be more abundant cultivate the deserts desalinate water i mean i think that leads to a whole new way of living personally right but desalinate the water um that's going to be a corporate thing uh, the government isn't going to go and create uh, desalination plants. They may set up and fund and help fund uh, a demonstration plant. A demonstration plant won't supply mm -hmm. the needs of a community. It's just there to demonstrate technology. That's what the government does. It, 
it creates demonstration projects so that the corporate sector can then take over yeah. and run with it. And I don't think we're going to get away from that as long as we have the uh, economic global economic system that we have based mm -hmm. on supply and demand, based on coinage, based mm -hmm. on the idea that there's money. But, uh, but how will the arrival, let's say they do show up in 2027, how do you feel it will change our world? Well, I more than anything, uh, it will on an individual basis, um, it will then uh, inform us as to our true origins and our true purpose on the planet. That there is a better way to live uh, on that's, the planet. And so through that, leading by example, that this is the technology we have, and this is the, how we share this technology amongst us, that could be a model, serve as a model for that. Now, will there be obstacles to that? Probably. There will be obstacles to that. Um, well, uh, like big agriculture, big pharma, and uh, big power, uh, fossil fuel industry, it may step in and trying to prevent that from happening. That's probably very likely. But if there's legislation support in US law, legislation, and, and keep in mind the legislators are servants of us, we put them into their positions. They should respond to our our uh, desires, our needs. If they listen to their constituents and we set up a hue and cry mm -hmm. that uh, we, we're not going to do this the same old way, we want to change the way we live. We want the world to change how they live so that we don't have this global adversarial competition, both economically and militarily. Um, that's what needs to happen from within, from, from mm -hmm. us. But we need legislation. We need, we need a government that understands that that can that can then set their policies based on the legislation that our right. representatives have but written. you know we think we elect government officials but it's also corporations that give them campaign money that they owe so it's not as clear as like yes idealistic democracy there seems to be a lots of manipulations of right Right, and that's the loophole. Um, yeah. Because as individuals, two thousand five hundred dollars per election cycle. Um, that applies to everybody, um, but there's something called political action committees, and that was the loophole that exists. That you can set up a political action committee, and they can spend money on behalf of a candidate, not for the candidate. So mm -hmm. they can they say uh, they can say we we like this candidate, and we're going to collect money to support that candidate, but that candidate's campaign committee will not get any dime of it. The law allows that. And as long as we have that type of political action committee mechanism, uh, we'll never change what you just described. We'll never right. get off of that. So we have to change that. But getting back to our main topic, because we can talk about politics and all that, you know, I don't know that gets anyone anywhere because it's obviously, there's a system that's very stubbornly in place. but. As far as the UFO phenomena and what we talked about last time, interdimensionality, uh, because you you said in the law somewhere in the in the bills, it says it's not it doesn't necessarily fly in the air or the sea or the land. Can you restate that what you said in that um, part of the um, NDAA? Sure. It's it's in the uh, Senate Select Committees uh, for Intelligences. IAA. It's in the IAA for the FY23 period. IAA is the Intelligence um... Authorization Act. Okay. 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 So in the Intelligence Authorization Act or IAA, it does define what the domains of the phenomenon are. So first they call the phenomenon unidentified aerospace under sea phenomenon. And that's more accurate as to the fact that they are have been seen going into and out of the water. And they also fly in our skies. Uh, they also fly in space. So that bounds like what, where the phenomenon operates, the transmedium nature of the phenomenon. The legislation also defines the domains of the phenomenon as being uh, under the sea, on the sea, uh, aerial, in the sky, in space, so forth. That's the domains of the uh, phenomenon. It also states that the phenomenon can 
uh, also appears in domains other than what I just said. So other you, than land, sea, and air, other than land, that's land, so sea, vague. air, and space. Uh, yes, it is not. It says it's it's we we understand that uh, the phenomenon can appear in non-material form. That the phenomenon can appear as as an energy entity, which that's we call in, orbs. That's in, that's in the They do not Congress say that. They do not oh, say okay. that explicitly. But the fact that they stated what, what these domains are related to the Earth as a terrestrial planet, they stated these domains. And they also stated, also, we want you to look at the phenomenon when it exists other than those terrestrial domains, they don't say interdimensional, but they sure do imply it. And that's the way I personally interpret that. Well, yeah, what else could it mean if it's not in a physical domain? So uh, what do you make? Is that part of, a, 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 is that been an investigation of some branches of government, this interdimensional research? I mean, that's pretty far out. Um, the interdimensional research, I guess, uh, if, if you look at um, remote viewing, you can say that's a type of interdimensional research because here we have a human being uh, doing what most people would call astral projection for lack of a better term. I don't think it's completely accurate that that's what remote viewing is, but it's like a consciousness uh, traveling to another location in time and space to witness what might be occurring in that location in time and space. So the physical body stays in stasis, but the consciousness of that physical body can travel. And it, it went in traveling there, there have been remote viewers who have encountered these other beings, these non-human intelligent beings and reported back to the government, this is what I saw. Mm -hmm. and well, so. Yeah. That, I think, is the basis for understanding, at least from the congressional viewpoint, that people are seeing these phenomena in other forms. And also a skinwalker, this high strangeness at skinwalker, um, the phenomena appear there in other forms other than something physical. There was a feeling of, uh, mm. some people describe just trepidation, this anxiety that occurred mm. in encountering the phenomena at skinwalker. Well, the other thing, though, that I get from what you're saying is there's a hyperdimensionality to the craft that they can disappear here and appear somewhere. They travel through an interdimensional wormhole, whatever that is. And that's what I think they they mean by not sea, land or air, that there's a hyperdimensional travel technology that these craft have. Would you agree with that? Well, if there's a wormhole on the on the planet Earth, uh, we'll be sucked into it. Uh, I don't think there's a wormhole being used. Uh, well, they it's can more create like their own way. Yeah, there's a way that they have a propulsion technology which we may or may not have exploited, and they use that propulsion technology uh, to travel at extreme speeds um, on planet Earth that seem to defy the Newtonian laws of physics. So it's that's not why just. But the it's not just knows. extreme speeds. They, when you could see it in the videos, they appear here and then they appear here. So there's some kind of um, self-generating wormhole technology that these craft have for hyperdimensionality. Is my guess. Uh, I think it more of the cloaking technology that they can make. It, they can use extreme speed plus cloaking, uh, plus a high acceleration, pulling like tremendous amount of G's that would kill a human. Uh, 10 Gs, and it's very stressful for a human body, 10 and a half Gs, some short and stature pilots, mostly female, can take 10 and a half Gs, I'm told. Uh, but that's a very rare case. Uh, but for most humans, 10 and a half Gs beyond that, you're faint, and beyond that, you'll die. Um, they're not affected by it. And so there's probably some exploitation or some use of their technology that enables them to do that. I don't, I don't buy the wormhole. To me, that's that doesn't seem to be possible. Uh, but yeah. there is some technology that enables them to move to and fro very fast, to make them appear and disappear, uh, to use signature management to um, hide 
to change their shape and to uh, also um, seem to like disappear, like appear right. and disappear, lack of a better term, thin air. Well, that's what I'm saying. There's a dimensional doorway, but I, I don't yeah. know that. I, um, so just to wrap up, I, I, um, what can we expect in the next year from this new legislation that's been proposed? Well, um, I am hoping that um, the provisions that survive will include the provision that um, forces the government to reveal all of the operations to cover this up. The disinformation, misinformation, lying to the public, um, using social media to lie to the public, that this will be revealed because if this legislation passes and becomes US law, that will no longer be legal. They will have to tell Congress, not only are we doing this, but this is what we did and here's the reason why. The other part is to open up to the public uh, a means to share information. And then within the US government, including former US uh, officers, US government officers like myself, a means of reporting our uh, knowledge and our experiences uh, to Congress without any fear of retribution, uh, mm -hmm. without any uh, damage to those who are currently serving their careers. And um, so th these are very promising, but also it takes the uh, monitoring of the government away from the government. There, there are the inspectors general, there are the directors and the department heads of these eight, uh, departments and agencies, but it gives the uh, implementation to report what the government knows to the Comptroller General. The Comptroller General is responsible for monitoring compliance with, with this law. The Comptroller General of the United States is the watchdog of Congress. And the Comptroller General of the United States is a nonpartisan bicameral appointment that is repre representing both sides of the aisle uh, and representing both the House and Senate sides of Congress. It answers only to Congress, not to the president, not to any corporation, not to the Department of Defense, and not to the intelligence community. However, it, the uh, Comptroller General is empowered to get information from all of these folks. Pull the information out because the law says that's your job now. You are going to go and pull information out from these folks, as well as the National Archivist, pull information out, whether it's classified or unclassified. You're in charge now, and you will report to us if the executive branch of government has been cooperating. And if not, we will take further action against the non-cooperation. So I have uh, a strong hope for that. And also they're getting rid of something, uh, they're proposing to get rid of something uh, in the House version of the IAA. I should say there's a Senate version of the IAA and the House version of the IAA. And the House version of IAA, there's another part, uh, another section dealing with something called controlled unclassified information. Unclassified information controlled by the government. That's another step in like releasing information because they said, yeah, we know this information on this classifies, but not in the public domain. But because you, Mr. and Ms. Citizen, can put together this unclassified information and come up with something that's classified, uh, we're going to control it so you don't get it. Uh, they're saying, uh, we believe that that executive order signed by President Obama, which is 13556, that it be repealed. I never liked controlled unclassified information. Uh, information because it sounds like a misnomer. It sounds like an oxymoron. Yeah. And so that might release a lot of uh, unclassified information held by the government because the government holds it and because the government knows this unclassified information deals with something to do with the UAP topic that we're going to control this. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we're going to, and even though it's, it's real, we're going to say that it's fake. And so we're going to go out on social media and say this Class, unclassified information, which we know to be real, and provide you with great insight into what's happening, 
we're going to say it's unreal. We're going to say it's it's fake. We're going to say the person who uh, uh, shared this information is not with the government, that never had that job, <laughs> mm-hmm. so forth and so on. So that's another part of, um, of the IA in the House side. So all of it put together will step forward and probably have more hearings. We'll probably have unclassified reports that they're saying that not only classified, but unclassified reports, not only classified hearings, but unclassified hearings from, from the government. And I'm hoping that next time they'll put these folks under oath. Uh, Mr. Bray and Mr. Moultrie were never placed under oath. They gaveled and started immediately. Uh, the practice is, if you have witnesses before any committee or subcommittee of Congress, you, you put them under oath. And they never did that. Mm. isn't that unusual so well they also just could have been sort of patsies that really truly did not know anything and that's probably why they got the job i mean right so they couldn't be they do know things they They do do know things but uh under the provision that they're operating under they're allowed to To not be forthcoming no not be forthcoming in public domain if they lie in behind closed sessions they lie to congress um, the federal marshals will be knocking on their door. You can't mm-hmm. lie to Congress. You lie to Congress. You can plead the fifth all you want. So likely they will plead the fifth or they would defer to NDAs or defer to closed session and reveal everything in closed session. Well, let me ask you, you if this is passed and it's okay to come forward, do you have, um, are you held by an NDA that you would be able to come forward and speak anything you know, or is it, you really feel you don't know anything to add to this I was, subject? I was never read into any UFO UAP program whatsoever. So I do not have those program specific uh, compartments. Program sp- sp- uh, specific meaning I know what's really going on inside. I know the craft are really being exploited. I know where it's happening and I know that there are real bodies and so forth and so on. I don't have that information at that level mm-hmm. at all. What I have uh, is uh, my understanding of how information was collected from a foreign government who are looking into the same issue. So those types of uh, intelligence sources and methods, I can never reveal because they're not just reporting on UFOs and UAPs, they're reporting on some advancement in um, some weapon system that they know the government's working on. So right. I can't reveal that, right? So, yeah. uh, but I, I am available to anyone uh, in the legislative or even the executive sides of government to let them know what I know in a secure environment, in a SCIF. Um, right. But I can't, I can't, to your audience, I can't say uh, this is going on or that's going on. What I was able to say, I've already stated in my various interviews prior to this right. one and with this interview, with you but there's things you can't say but there's nothing you can't say about ufos because you weren't read into that act so that's why you're hearing from me yet i call (laughs) this informed speculation it's informed speculation in that i know what the interest was within the u.s government i definitely know what the interest was in an adversarial government and so putting everything together and putting the one unclassified briefing i got which I can't prove it happened. That was the one I alluded to in a hotel room. Uh, I can give you the address. It's 960 uh, Chain Bridge Road in McLean, Virginia. There's two hotels there and there's a Marriott there. And that Marriott, um, before 9-11 um, occurred and after the year 2000 occurred because Y2K was done and 9-11 didn't happen yet. Sometime in that time frame, we met and uh, there was a representative uh, from the chief scientists of the CIA. And there was a representative from the historical staff of CIA. And together they briefed on um, the uh, UFO issue as, uh, as the CIA saw it from the very beginning, uh, 1947 onward. And they, they also- they, You weren't part of that. Were you part of that briefing? Yeah, you, I was invited oh, to that. that. Oh, so they briefed. Oh, it is classified, you're saying? Unclassified. That there whole C- meeting is unclassified. Yeah, there were CIA officers there, and there were also um, members of academia, 
there's a sign-in sheet and the folks from academia, they signed their email addresses .edu and all of us uh, govies uh, sign our email addresses uh, ending the domain .gov. So right. that's who- so How many attending. people were there? How many people? Uh, we filled up a conference room. I would say not more than three dozen, and, and, and probably less. And, and why were you invited to that? Uh, I, to this day, do not know. <laughs> I, uh, the gentleman that invited me was from the office of the chief scientist. It's a gentleman uh, that I worked with on other projects. Uh, he was aware of my interest because on my desk, I did have a, um, a plush toy, I would call it, of a traditional gray, except uh, the plush toy was green. And I would fold the uh, little gray being uh, in a way that he'd sit on top of my Dell monitor and so my interest in this entire topic was well known, uh, well known. What? And uh, he invited me to this. Mm -hmm. And I also recognize another gentleman I personally knew uh, from my home office. And knowing this gentleman's past um, mm -hmm. work in my home office, uh, I determined that, yeah, he, he needed to be there. Mm -hmm. But th there's very few people I recognize other than two individuals that were sponsoring mm -hmm. the meeting and those two other two gentlemen. I never heard about that meeting, actually. And is there a record of that meeting? Absolutely not. I threw the oh. record away. Uh, it was oh. unclassified. Um, the agenda was published unclassified. Usually, if it's a classified document, it can be, un it can be unclassified. Mm -hmm. If it's classified, it doesn't matter. At top to bottom, there's something called portion marking and labeling. Mm -hmm. And they're labeled top and bottom unclassified. And this didn't even have that as unclassified. And so they handed it to us. There was no security officer there. I could carry my cell phone into the conference room. It's not a skiff. Mm -hmm. That's your biggest clue that it was unclassified. It's not a skiff. There's no security officer checking badges. I never showed my badge. I pocketed my badge. No one wore badges. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's a discussion about, you know, 1947 to current times, um, the discussion about uh, craft that we're seeing before, that 10% of the um, records of craft being seen in US skies are actually uh, extra, uh, extra or non-terrestrial, uh, non, uh, I just use the word extraterrestrial, but uh, actually non. UFO craft, non-terrestrial so craft, 10%. Uh, uh, and they also talked about um, the fact that, um, that uh, when the human genome was sequenced, that um, they had a high interest in alien DNA, which applies to me that they went back and that there is a body or bodies, or there are tissue samples that they were able to then use the technology uh, later for human genome sequencing to go back to something they held and make the statement, according to this officer, that the uh, US government has been interested in human DNA since the end of World War II. Wait, uh, let me just understand DNA. that. They, they Are you saying that when the human genome was sequenced, they may have the illusion found extraterrestrial DNA within the human genome? Are you, are you, is that what they were implying? Other, other side, other way. Oh. You're missing, um, oh, we're missing just me. one part of it. Uh, the side that? we're missing is they use the technology once in, when inquired, when acquired, they use the technology oh. to go back to look at perhaps bodies, perhaps samples of tissue. And then they notice knowing that if we sequence human DNA already, the human genome, knowing that, oh my gosh, there's sequences in there that are similar in humans. Why is that? Oh, oh, oh And oh. then further, according to this briefing that was unclassified, that I told the pre-classification review board, this is what I know, um, that they also said that there's a high interest in certain familial lines, that is in certain generational lines of people on the planet now, that they carry this this added enhancement, this alien DNA added enhancement in their human genome. That's it's passed from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was what was revealed to me. And third, the third part of this meeting was the future from the perspective of 2000, 2001, keeping that in mind. In the future, there'll be devices that you can hold in your hand to access all of this information and other information globally all over the world. Um, there will be a, a huge amount of technology uh, accessible to people and they will be able to get this information through this technology. 
they'll be like sharing information both visually and uh, through audio, like we're doing now, talking right. about everything, not just this, but everything. And we want to make that happen. That is the intelligence community want to facilitate that to happen. Well, that is so unusual. Is there a name for this meeting? This um, or no? And it's just something because I, I never heard you. I've never heard you talk about this. And yeah, in various uh, in various interviews, I've I've had to address this. Okay. Um, again, not only was the agenda unclassified, so was the sign up sheet. I had both in my possession because I could carry it. There was nothing classified about it. No one stopped me from taking it out. Uh, I noticed that uh, some other people were left the uh, meeting with both in hand, the academics. And I wish I had that um, sign up sheet because it will show you who in academia with .edu domain names uh, is privy to this type of information. Y yes, that I would wonder be if it's online. Mark. And it's not, what, did, you, did you recognize any of the academics there? No, I didn't, no. I just That's recognized the two CIA officers uh, attending with me as audience members and the two CIA officers on stage. Right. And who, who were they? You don't, I don't, I guess you can't give us the names of the people Absolutely on stage. Absolutely not. Absolutely but not. I know that's okay. I'm not, I'm not asking for them, but how do you think they, they accumulated that whole, all that information from 1947 to the genome, to the future? What is their resources for having um, got, have had that knowledge? So they're CIA officers officers classified at top secret SCI. So that information S is on top secret SCI. And it was determined that uh, there's certain pieces of information that they felt like they could share mm -hmm. in an unclassified world. And so they did so. Now, That's this type of information is what um, in the executive order 13556, that's known as unclassified, controlled unclassified information. So it's mm -hmm. unclassified information I just told you, but yeah. there's certain parts of the government who wish that to be controlled. So why why do they, why do they have CUI? They should get rid of it, my opinion. But, All right, uh, well, that's, that's correct. Happened. Thank you for that little piece because I wasn't aware because, and that's basically all you ever heard from the CIA about UFOs, no. UAPs. Oh. Uh, the others I said um, uh, about oh. uh, what I know about uh, what other countries right. Uh, right. have. Have investigated, been, have, have researched. Uh, the only thing I can say, uh, because it was stated in the public domain on the Russian side, that there was a, a major general in the Russian Air Force, I believe, his name is Vasily Alexeyev. He stated in the Russian press that the Soviet government and the Russian government had a program to work with these UFOs, UAPs, to lure them to the ground so that they can have encounters with the craft. And I don't know if they've mentioned occupants. I don't know if anyone come out of, came out of the craft. Mm -hmm. And so like, here's this uh, Russian uh, major general. Uh, do I believe him? Yes. Why? Because I saw something like that. Um. So I can say that uh, he should be believed. Well, thank you, John. Thank you for, you know, revealing more truth. There probably were other meetings that maybe you just weren't invited to, possibly on the subject or. Oh, I'm, I disinvited myself to several meetings. W why did you? Didn't you want to know? Why did you disinvite yourself? I didn't need to know. Um, already had what I need to know, and oh. it didn't uh, serve me to get into the programmatic details. I sent two engineers to the Orb Working Group. And, oh, there was an uh, orb meeting. There was an orb. Yeah, that preceded by uh, a few years the ALSAP. If you think of ALSAP being thought of in 2007 and actually implemented in 2008, uh, mm -hmm. this occurred long before that. So Lakovsky, always... may, he may have been at that meeting, Lakovsky. I don't no. know, because I didn't attend. I wasn't there. Um, he was a GS-13 when that meeting occurred, when the, the, that working group was in operation. So the, you're saying the CIA had a working group about orbs? No? Not the CIA, the intelligence oh. community. Oh, the intelligence community. Not, I, yeah, I get. It was, it was uh, a DNI, ODNI working group. I CIA see, about... was a participating member, and there were other agencies and contractors participating mm -hmm. members. 
is that is that information still top secret about what they talked about at those absolutely. meetings? Absolutely. That's the other that's thing the, I can't say. That is interesting, though. I mean, that's the, yeah. The the fact of yeah uh, is less sensitive. The fact that something occurred is less sensitive. The content then, of what occurred is what's sensitive. Oh, I wonder. So yeah. Huh. So so you hear fact of. Um, that's all that like uh, Lou Elizondo, he talks a lot about the fact of that something occurred, the fact of that this is occurring, the fact of that something will be occurring in the future, he can talk about. But when you ask him about the contents, uh, he will rely on his non-disclosure agreements. So if you ask anybody who is associated with this uh, from the government side about the contents of what's in the dis what can't be disclosed, um, they won't answer that. But the fact that something uh, is of that nature they can talk about. So when these NDAs, whatever that legislation um, proclaims is, is passed into law, the, the fact that there won't be a retribution, could people from those ORB meetings come forward and say, this is what was talked about at the meeting? No, because they're in a compartment that still exists. Oh, so even, within, even with this whistleblower um, legislation, they cannot come forward. Absolutely not. That's not whistleblowing. That's the releasing unauthorized release of classified information under the Espionage Act of the United States. They won't do that unless they want to go to jail. I um, see. The, there's a mechanism to release it. And that's what uh, I'm stressing. There's now a mechanism where that can be released by the government because they're looking at every NDA. Congress wants the Department of Defense and the intelligence community to look at every NDA associated with these um, aerospace undersea phenomena and justify why those NDAs are there to Congress behind closed doors. So there's some accountability happening, which is why the Comptroller General is in charge of making sure it happens. He's the mm -hmm. accountability officer for Congress. He's the watchdog of Congress. He can compel, legally can compel the Secretary of Defense and the DNI to comply with these provisions and the U.S. law now. He can, but will he? Who is the Comptroller General right now? Uh, I don't know his name, but uh, I looked up his name and I forgot it. It starts That's with okay. I N. looked it up too. Guess what? It's been in office since 2008. Right. And it... Since 2008. And so he's still in office now. It's not a political position. Mm -hmm. You can't threaten him for losing his job because <laughs> he won't lose his job. Uh, I guess but Congress, he, he works for Congress. Congress can fire him. But will he reinforce? He, you say he can and it's his job, but will that happen? Well, if he wants to comply with U.S. law, he will. Because U.S. law says that that's his job now. That's one I of his see. jobs. He does a lot of things in terms of oversight of the government. He does a lot of things as the watchdog of Congress. Now, what they did was to put this entire UAP issue under his umbrella of responsibilities. And if he wants to comply with U.S. law, he will do it. And he's so, going to make sure that the other folks comply with U.S. law as well. But is it law yet or is it about to be passed into law? No, usually the NDAA gets passed in December of every year. And the IAA gets blended into uh, a bigger bill called the Consolidated Appropriations Act. And so the most current NDAA is, was passed on December 27, 2021. And the current IA was passed as part of this Consolidated Appropriations Act on March 15, 2022. So, those so let's just clarify, the National Defense Authorization Act is the NDAA, and what's the relation to the Intelligence Authorization Act? How are they connected? They're connected in this way. There's some overlap there. Uh, the NDAA is mostly what we call Title X or the Armed Forces of the United States the Army, okay. the Navy, the Marine Corps, Air Force, and now Space Force. Right. That's the NDAA. And the NDAA, there's some overlap because not only does the Department of Defense have its intelligence agencies, those agencies are also shared on the ODNI side. Mm -hmm. So if you take NSA, NSA is both a Department of Defense intelligence agency and also a ODNI intelligence agency. And then you go right down the line, except for CIA. CIA is the only independent intelligence agency. The mm -hmm. only independent doesn't never answer to the Secretary of Defense. Oh, really? Secretary so of Defense can, get... can ask us questions, 
and we will be happy to respond to his questions and helping him understand intelligence that he, his side may have collected. But but it does he, answer the controller, right? It CIA would answer to the every general. piece of the government answers to the controller. Controller. Okay, controller. The controller. Yeah, you don't want to be called hauled up before the controller because then that means that <laughs> you're not doing something right. Right. Um, well, you know, this has been really a great insight into the workings of government, what it needs. Is there anything else you could say about that 2000 uh, CIA meeting in the year 2000, 2001 um, that, you, that, that really so shocked and surprised you? Uh, nothing shocked and surprised me, really, uh, because I was a believer going into CIA, had these mm -hmm. lifetime experiences since I was small. I've been taken aboard craft. Mm -hmm. I've been medically examined by visitors, for lack of a better term. So none of that surprised me at all. Would you say you're an abductee? No, I was taken. I wanted to be taken. Uh, abductee implies non-compliance, non-voluntary. And, and, and that does exist. I mean, that does I exist. Feel... But for me, the only disappointment I have is that they brought me back. <laughs> okay. I didn't want to come back. Well, I, you were and you were conscious the whole time that these things happened to you. Uh, I, I perceive them as something that I was conscious of. There's tactile feeling. Um, I was conscious of it. Uh, whether they apply covering memories, um, mm -hmm. I know uh, many of experiencers say, I saw them and then they turn into something else. It could have been a covering memory or whatnot. Mm -hmm. But uh, for that experience, uh, I had markings on my body that I didn't have before that experience. And I had other experiences where they left markings on my body. Wow. And then there's the whole discussion about implants that is a whole nother well, we're going to do a show on discussion. Let's do a whole discussion about your experiences, maybe along with some other contactees, and we can just compare notes and maybe you'll be contacted again. But it feels like this work you're doing, sharing with the public, may have been instigated by some of that contact experience. You know, the fact that Could you're be. opening Absolutely. people's you're opening people's minds now because you're one of yeah. the people who understands the inside of things you know right it could be the purpose for my uh sightings of orbs and my contact experiences that it would lead to uh the position i'm in within yeah. government that i sought this type of position and mm -hmm. um now it's time to share what i know and i'm doing that as best i can well th and you're a real you're you're a patriot and someone who's standing up for the truth and you know you're very aware of the framing of government, what you're allowed to say and what you're not, and you can and you've done a great job making us aware of what's possible and the fact that we can might see a real change happening in the world. So that's my aspiration that there will be real change in the world ultimately, because none of this would matter unless change happens. Exactly. No, thank thank you, John, for your for coming forward and uh, your study and Let's be in contact. And oh, I think Linda Moulton Howe wants to talk to you too. Would, would that be? Oh, something? absolutely. Yes. I've been a big okay. fan of Linda's uh, ever since I heard of her in Coast to Coast AM back yeah. in the Art Bell day. So uh, Linda's, uh, I'm, a well, she, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan. She wants you on her show too, to talk to you. Okay. So I'll give her your email and thanks and stay in touch um, with any updates from, you know, legislation and everything that might change our position in this um, understanding of the phenomena. Well, thank you for having me, Alan. Of course, fun. John, thanks for coming back. I'm Alan Steinfeld talking to John Ramirez, ex-officer from the CIA, who's not revealing anything he can't say, just revealing what he can say. And it's been very much appreciated. So thank you everyone online for watching. We had a good audience here and John will be in touch.